Yeah, thank you very much. And I thank you for the promotion. I'm not a doctor. I'm just an evil MBA and a number cruncher and an economist. Okay. Uh, but uh, but I, I appreciate the the vote of confidence here. Uh, thanks, everyone. My name is Dwayne Schultes. I'm the CEO of Vital Transformation. We're a health economic consultancy. Uh, we also do strategy work for a lot of companies. I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint here. Um, please let me know if you can see it or not. Uh, is my PowerPoint showing? Yeah. For... That's great. Thank you. So I'm going to walk through some of the work we've done. As many of you may be aware, Biogen and uh, ASI are under what's called a national coverage determination by CMS, Medicare Services in the United States. We did a lot of work on the impact of the national coverage determination for Biogen in 2022. We've also done a lot of work on the Inflation Reduction Act. And I'm going to talk specifically on some of these regulations and how they're impacting and what we project will occur regarding some of the future for R&D and how these are going to impact the economic situation for neurological diseases broadly, as well as Alzheimer's research specifically. So again, what we've done is we've looked at a research cohort of 551 clinical developments going back to 1993. We've analyzed all early stage investments, venture funding, grants, IPOs, you name it, all the funding that's gone in. We've also then looked at the length of time it takes to develop a clinical project around Alzheimer's disease and neurological uh, disorders more broadly. And then we modeled the impact of CMS's Center for Medicaid Services decision, which will functionally act like a delay in providing market access. So we've done all this for the current portfolio of clinical trials. This was submitted to the CTAD conference. We had a presentation in San Francisco last year. I'm happy to provide the poster. And um, I'll be taking questions as we go through. If anyone has any questions, please, please feel free. So what's going on with neurology? Well, if you look at the high watermark for neurological research globally, believe it or not, it was 2009. And you can see here that in 2009, there were actually, if you look at the top 10, 15 companies that were active at that time in that portfolio, you had roughly 267 active clinical developments. Now, we'll look what happened between 2009 and 2014. You had a more than halving of all clinical developments that were going on. There's an enormous amount of economic pressure, and you've seen an exodus of firms working in neurological disorders. And the reason why is because the failure rate is brutal, which I'll get into later. Now, if you look at what's going on with CMS and essentially them attacking what's called the accelerated approval, where you have an indication and then you're able to, based on early, shall we say, secondary endpoints that should provide a good future outcome based on statistical analysis. And this is what the um, amyloid thesis is that we think it's a good predictor. Um, what they've done now is CMS has basically said, if you're coming in with a monoclonal antibody that's on an accelerated approval, we're gonna force you to put everybody in a clinical trial and a registry. Now, the clinical trial part's been reduced because a size drug has had a full approval by the FDA, but they're still required to be part of the registry. And I should also point out that neither of these drugs have been approved in Europe as yet. And do they have an, they do not have HTA. So essentially what you've done is you've isolated monoclonal antibodies, the Alzheimer's drug development, whether or not the drug has been approved in accelerated approval. And we're seeing that this is having an enormous chilling effect because what it essentially does is it means you have to dedicate more time, assets, and resources to a clinical trial, and it delays the time to market. So if we look at how bad is it? Well, if you look at before Adjuhelm and Lecambi, there were only three currently active approved drugs for treating symptoms, not the actual underlying condition of Alzheimer's disease from 551 clinical developments. That means a failure rate of 99.5%. I'll say that again. That's a 99.5% failure rate for all developments since 1993 until 2022 in Alzheimer's disease. Now that means as an investor, or someone who's doing an early stage biotech investment, you are discounting your cash flow by at least 99%. So all of your decisions on a risk rate, risk weighted basis are reduced by 99%. And this is a fact, we cannot change this. Even with Lecambi and Agile, we're down around 98%. That is still a very, very high rate of failure. 
So the other problem you've got is these clinical trials, because they're outcomes trials, and anybody who works in clinical trials will tell you, if you're doing an outcomes trial, they take a lot of time by definition. So what do we see? This is the length of time that clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease have increased since 2004 from all the trials that we've been able to ascertain. So what do we see? That turns out to a 4% year-on-year change in time. And you saw that in 2022, the Lakembi and Agile trials were pushing, uh, basically at that point, they're coming pretty close to 12 years. So these are taking a long time. Now, what does that mean? Functionally, you've only got eight years of patent life left, assuming you come to market. So if, if the CMS, if the Center for Medicaid Services, puts in a coverage decision, that means you need to run another clinical trial for two years that's going to restrict your population to a clinical trial population of 1,500 people. That means you're functionally going to be in the market for, let's say you're able to run that trial in two or three years. That means you're only going to have five years of patent life left. That's the fundamental problem with this equation. Essentially, you're reducing the time for companies to be able to be in the market by putting in this coverage decision. This is taking a long time. And let's not kid ourselves. These trials cost billions of dollars because they took thousands of patients. Both of these trials for Agile Helm and Lecambi had over 2,000 patients each. So if we look at specifically, we've seen what's happened to neuro neuro neurology broadly, the neurological pipeline regarding development since 2009, there's been a halving. We see the same thing here specifically in Alzheimer's disease. If we go back to 2009 to 2022, we've seen more than a halving of all clinical developments that have occurred in Alzheimer's disease, even with the moderate, well, what some would say the qualified success of Agile Helm and Lecambi being approved. We don't see an enormous amount of uptake in the space. We still see that this has been radically suppressed because of the risk ratio of trying to do this and the national coverage determination. We don't see a big increase that's occurred when these drugs went to phase three and then went to registration with FDA. We haven't seen an uptick in 22, 2022 and 2021 in clinical developments under under being undergone for Alzheimer's disease. Again, people just don't want to touch it. The risks are too high and the benefit is too speculative. So I'm not going to go through this. This is the modeling strategy, what we did. Um, I'll happily provide the slides afterwards. Uh, this is also available on our website under the work we did for Biogen. Just basically, to cut to the chase, we looked at every single development that was undergoing at the time. We then modeled this based on what we thought was a cost of about 100000 per person per year, which has since turned out to be fairly accurate. Uh, quite accurate, actually. And then we modeled the amount of people that would need to be involved in the clinical trial based on the actual data, 55, 200, and 1,800 for phase one and two and three, uh, respectively. We then modeled a delay in subjects that were required to no longer be available based on the fact that you need to be involved in the clinical trial. And then we said, okay, what is going to happen if you delay this based on the natural co coverage decision in order to get your reimbursement? So, and we discounted the cash flow based on the 99% failure rate. And then we looked at the impact on the sector as a whole in trying to develop these things based on the 41 clinical trials that were active at the time we did our analysis. Okay, very quick thumbnail sketch. So what did we see? Well, not to be surprised, I suppose, there were uh, 45, excuse me, clinical trials undergone. If you just looked at it at the time that they were active and the possibility of having a positive return on investment, about 39 of the 45 were potentially decent investments, assuming that CMS didn't change the goalposts on being able to get a return. So basically, 39 of the 45 looked good on paper, but you put a three-year three delay in, look what happens just based on because of the time to market and the cost of capital, suddenly this whole thing turns south. 42 of the 45 are now negative in shareholder investment equity. In other words, they are bad investments, even if they're approved with a three-year delay caused by the national coverage determination. And if you get to a four-year delay, basically you wipe out the entire cohort. This is the reality. I mean, this was going to be, this is still hugely devastating. And what you see is even with just running the registry, the constraints that puts on the market in the United States are such that they are still having trouble getting uptake. This is a real problem. And this is gonna have an enormous chilling effect on the sector. If you wanna look at this as percentages, we've done this the other way. So 87% have a positive ROI today, 
based on the current scenarios before the national coverage determination. Once you start implementing the coverage determination and put in delays, you're radically tanking an already difficult market segment in order to get a positive return on investment. You're seeing over 90%, 90, um, 93% negative with only 7% being positive with a three-year delay. And again, you're down around a 2% uh, positive rate by the time you get to a four-year delay. Now, because we don't just want to say these things, we want to run the statistics on this. So we tested, okay, maybe this is just bad data. Maybe it's disease. Clinical trials are subject to capriciousness and bad malinvestments. Let's run a decision scenario and say, okay, if the decision is implemented or not, how much of this ROI impact can be put specifically on the delay of CMS? Overwhelmingly, statistically, we're answering close to 80% of the variability of the model with a very strong p-value. The decision is the driver of these losses. It, it really is statistically solid. So these delays are tangible, they're meaningful, and they will have an impact on the sector. And we are seeing investors move away because of it, because it creates enormous amounts of uncertainty and it really reduces the ability of these people to have a return on investment, given the high risk, the 99% failure rate in the sector. So if you model this out, we remember that chart back here, where I showed you the trends. Okay, if you model this out linearly and say, okay, what do we project with the delays? That's actually what you're gonna see. So this is what we anticipate if we, you know, project these onto the current clinical developments, you're going to see an exodus of clinical trials. And we have seen a big drop in Alzheimer's research since the NCD has gone into place. So now let's combine this with the Inflation Reduction Act. There's a big problem with the Inflation Reduction Act. The two drugs we have now, the successful drugs, Lecambi and Adjuhelm, are monoclonal antibodies. They require um, the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. This is often done through a lumbar puncture or through you know, an injection, it's hard because crossing the blood-brain barrier, particularly with something as big as a monoclonal antibody, is difficult. It's the equivalent of trying to put an elephant through the eye of a needle. It's very, very hard. So there is a preference here for maybe trying to develop small molecules. And if you see some of the companies now that are having a lot of success, at least in raising money, the ones that do, they're small molecule applications, which is great, but here's the problem. This puts them directly in the crosshairs of the Inflation Reduction Act, which overwhelmingly puts a penalty in on the small molecules versus the large molecules. Why is this important? Because if we look at the origination from the 10-year period from 2006 to 2016, this is publicly available research, not proprietary research in company. This is publicly available research, mostly academic driven, where we're looking at neurological disorders. What do you see? The top line is biologics. The bottom line is small molecules, new molecular entities. Overwhelmingly, this is a small molecule space. We see zero biologics in neurology that were publicly funded in this space. Zero. This is not our data. This is a peer review study. What does this mean? The Inflation Reduction Act that puts an enormous penalty on small molecules is going to overwhelmingly impact and have a de de demonstrable impact, deleterious impact on future neuroscience research using small molecules. How do we know this? Well, because a survey was done by Steve Potts, who's a CEO specialized in cancer development and small molecule development. He's surveyed all of the venture capitalists and a lot of the folks working in the space, and they have found that over 85% of venture capitalists are moving away from small molecules. Biotech executives is 70%. Overall, you're seeing you know, 75% of people avoiding small molecules. This is particularly acute in an area such as neurology, where the overwhelming need is the small molecules that cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, if you want to, don't want to take my word for it, this is Paris Pharma, Sharma, who's a very good venture capitalist in Toronto. We regularly track uh, an analysis he publishes for certain people who subscribe to his service. You know, he's seen an enormous drop of 9% in neurology compared to cardiovascular disease. Why is that? Cardiovascular disease is generally in the 40s. It's outside of the IRA population above 65, the Medicare age population. So neurology, oncology, these are areas that are going to be impacted by the IRA because they're dominated often by small molecule research. So we're seeing an enormous pull away from those assets. So in conclusion, you know, the high failure rate, a delay of more three, three or more years in neurology caused by uh, the national coverage determination of CMS specifically for Alzheimer's disease is going to be untenable. It's going to cause investors to walk away. Um, the decision to overturn uh, accelerated approvals is very bad. 
creates an enormous amount of uncertainty because the smaller indications, the orphan drugs, um, the highly speculative uh, new treatments that require novel novel mechanisms of action, it basically goes after the most novel science. And ironically, right now, NIH has focused a tremendous amount of research on orphan drugs and small targeted therapies that would overwhelmingly use the accelerated approval. It's a double barrel shot into the U.S. innovation ecosystem. It's terrible. It creates material risk to ROI, return on investment calculations for investors. It increases the risk for small molecules and neurology in particular, and it puts the entire U.S. government strategy to create incentives um, you know, for <laughs> the prescription drug benefit that was passed in 2004, puts all of that aside. And the use of accelerated approval is, uh, is vital to promote the viability of particularly orphan drugs and targeted therapies, as well as things like neurology that use novel mechanisms of action. And if you want to see the study, you can grab it from our website. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions for the last five minutes. I hope that's okay. It's a lot of material. I did my best. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Blaine, it's, is there, <laughs> you, you took all the hope. <laughs> now, <laughs> I, I, I think it's, uh, it needs really some, uh, some innovative innovation and uh, coming out of this. And there is, it's, it's really, it's really difficult. So what do you think? You think that prevention is now has the way to go? I, my concern is that we're putting so many disincentives right now into working on therapeutic areas where the government in the U.S. has the ability to control revenue. So I think anything that puts a Medicare age population in play is going to be very difficult. Obviously, 85% of the Alzheimer's population is over 65. So I, I think the the reality here is trying to do a solution that involves reimbursement under Medicare or Medicaid is going to be extremely challenging. Now, we do know that there's an enormous link, and particularly it's anybody who was at CTAD, uh, the conference last December, you know, what having an effective monoclonal antibody, a monoclonal therapy in the market, what it does now is we can now ascertain, ascertain and isolate responders and non-responders. So we're seeing pickup related to for example, um, diabetic receptors, insulin receptors in the brain. There seems to be a huge correlation there. So we are looking at other mechanisms, potential mechanisms of action. The problem is, how are you going to start putting in these combo therapies if we're disincentivizing research in the area? Now, when you see insulin receptor, that immediately screams diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Do you potentially see an interplay now with some of the anti-obesity drugs? Perhaps. And time will tell. So it may be that we end up looking for solutions for Alzheimer's by then doing something in parallel with the anti-obesity treatments coming out of Lilly and Novo Nordisk. I don't know, but given the insulin receptors, uh, the correlation that we're seeing with the insulin receptors related to responders and non-responders with the treatment pathway for Lecambi, maybe that's a possibility. And that gets you out of the over 65 population that allows you to maybe preventatively treat earlier. So that's a potential vector. Now, will that work? I don't know. This is speculative. I'm just looking at data. So time will tell. Yeah, surely it's uh, has been always a very difficult field, uh, also especially very volatile. But now it uh, seems to be a dead end for investors. Uh, I mean, there's just not. Uh, it's just not a good place to be <laughs> to put your. No. No, and part of the reason why I'm in D.C., we just released our study on margin rights and patents, and the Biden administration this morning announced that they're going to start uh, clawing back pricing on any drug that has uh, a government interest statement, in other words, where the NIH has contributed intellectual property. So we're just creating more uncertainty. It's uh, it's unbelievable. So um, I don't, it's going to get more challenging, not less, sadly. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any hard questions? Any pictures? Yes, anyone, I think everyone is a little bit shocked. <laughs> and, uh, but it, this is why we, we asked you uh, to give us this, uh, this talk. I think it's fantastic to, to be, uh, you know, to, to look at reality, to get kind of this reality shock test, <laughs> uh, because we are so, um, you know, fascinated and we are so into the technology, making the technology, but then, we also need to find uh, a market that uh, uh, you know gives us some 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 incentives back. 
Well, we predicted in 2022, if the national coverage determination from CMS wasn't rescinded, that Adjuhelm would probably not necessarily be pulled off the market, but would receive commercial support. That actually has occurred. So Biogen has stopped supporting Adjuhelm. And unfortunately, the Canby sales, you're not seeing, it's having some uptake, but not as much as one would expect given the population. Mm -hmm. um, so if CMS's decision was to try and restrict access, they've succeeded profoundly. But in the course of doing so, it's going to have a huge chilling effect on the sector. <clears throat> Manfred ha has his uh, hand raised. Yeah. When 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 you uh, uttered the word prevention, I had the same thing on my mind. I think we need to work all together uh, in, in this direction. We cannot wait for a solution for problems uh, that we have partially created ourselves. We need to start earlier. And at the last uh, conference of uh, the Alzheimer conference in Lausanne, it was uh, there was ma made a distinction between preventative vaccines and therapeutic vaccines. Maybe here there is a way uh, uh, to approach this. And as we learned earlier today as well, 10, 20 years earlier, we need the right diagnostics. But I think prevention is the way to go. You evoked uh, diabetes, and as you may have heard, certainly the term uh, that Alzheimer is diabetes type three. Uh, yeah. For the reasons probably you uh, you also you just uh, evoked and mentioned, we need we will have now we have more than four hundred million people with diabetes worldwide, and the, the the number is rising. We have and and diabetes type two is largely a preventable disease. We could prevent it if we would uh, do the right steps. A little bit like what we do with uh, in Alzheimer's with the thing, worldwide finger approach, um, where we have a multifactorial approach to uh, yeah to learn to live with Alzheimer or to prevent the progression of it. So here I would say we need to go for prevention. I think that's the only way to save our healthcare systems. Yeah, I mean, obviously the cost of the, part of the reason why CMS put the coverage decision in, despite the fact the demonstrable evidence and efficacy of Lecambi, which, you know, the, the reality is a one-third reduction in cognitive, you know, decline in that cohort is is huge. That's better than most cancer trials. So, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the evidence was unequivocal that was prevented the FDA, and the decision was unanimous for approval. It had nothing to do with the efficacy. It had everything to do with the cost, period. Now, this yeah. goes against, I have to say, this goes against the regulatory mandate of CMS. This violates their charter, technically. Mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. I would not be surprised if we do see litigation. Now, Asai has taken a very relaxed approach. They've been very quiet, very salta volce, unlike Biogen. They've tried to be nicely, nicely. Now, it's not worked for them, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so eventually, now there's other therapeutics coming. As I mentioned, there's a couple companies, smaller companies that have small molecule approaches, which are intriguing, which will avoid some of the area problems potentially. But the reality is they're going to be facing the same NCDs, national coverage determination that CMS is. Does this go to litigation saying that CMS is overstepping its bounds, as has much of the Biden administration across many of their legislative packages? And they've lost many, many cases in the U.S. Some of them, they've lost more federal cases for violations of constitutionality than any administration since, I think, 1948 or something like that. It's crazy. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see a litigation approach. I just don't think Asai is going to want to do that. It may be somebody else. Mm -hmm. 